Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am Sarah Lister. I'm director of the Oslo Governance Centre and I'm very pleased to welcome you here this morning. Uh, in a minute, I will hand the floor to our moderator for the first panel, Leila Bukhari. Uh, Leila is well known to many of you here, not only as the former State Secretary for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs responsible for this portfolio, but also as a published expert in her own right. Her full bio is in the uh, packs in front of you. So without further ado, I will hand the floor to Leila to take us forward in this first session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, and a very good morning to all of you. Um, ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, wonderful to be here this morning and good to see so many people who, who've actually been in the field for a while um, and new faces because we need new actors and stakeholders in this as well. And that's the dialogue we're going to have here today. I'm really honoured and I think we're all very honoured that we have such a distinguished opening panel um, now, um, which will help us hopefully, set the scene of the debate for the next two days. Two years ago, here in Oslo, um, March 2016 to be exact, some of us, many of us, met here um, to start to set off this debate on prevention of violent extremism. There has been some water under the bridge, as we say in Norwegian. Um, there have been policies tried, programs developed. Um, and some of you, many of you, are on, in this room, whether from capitals, from New York, from your multilateral seatings and settings, but also from on the ground. Important voices and important testimonies to what works and what doesn't work. Two years on, we meet here again. And the second global meeting to take stock of progress, to share experiences and ambitiously to distill lessons on policy, research and programming. That is a tall order. And there's no small task ahead of us. The context is clear and has become clearer over the last few years. No country is immune to what we're talking about these two, few days. We see a global decline in the number of fatalities, but the breadth of the threat is expanding. Now, how do we assess what, ha what we have reached, what successes have been made and what's, what's out there? What can we all do in this context? Now, this panel is here to try to kick us off in this. We have four keynote speakers, each extremely qualified in their capacity, and they will help us frame the current debate. First out, the Honourable Minister of International Development of Norway, Nicolas Astrup, followed by Mr. Achim, Achim Steiner, Administrator of UNDP, and he will be followed by Vladimir Voronko, the Under Secretary General of the UN Office of Counterterrorism, the very first USG of its kind, an honour that you're here with us as well. And finally, Her Excellency, Soumya Akal, State Minister of Sudan. You've been given 10 minutes each, to answer these uh, questions, and the floor is yours. I suggest we start off with Minister, Minister Astrup. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Laila. Your watch. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, delighted to welcome you all to Oslo to the second global meeting on preventing violent extremism. I would like to give a special welcome to Mr. Akim Steiner, the Administrator of the United Nations Development Programme, Mr. Vladimir Voronkov, uh, Under Secretary General of the UN Office of Counter Terrorism, and uh, last but not least, Mr. Somia uh, Okud, State Minister of International Cooperation of Sudan. Norway's Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ina Eriksen Sørede, sends her warmest uh, wishes for the conference. She very much regrets not being able to attend due to commitments in Brussels. Let me start by thanking the UNDP Oslo Governance Centre for putting together such a comprehensive agenda. The Norwegian government is deeply committed to the prevention of violent extremism. We have expressed our strong support for the UN Office of Counterterrorism since its, its establishment last year. I am therefore pleased to announce that Norway will contribute 10 million Norwegian kroners to the UN Office of Counterterrorism for the um, for the 2018-2021 period in partnership 
with UNDP. In our view, the UN must play a central role in international efforts to prevent violent extremism. This is a long-term effort that will require a lot of resources. We need to take a whole-of-government approach. We therefore believe it will be essential that the UN family work closely together and is well-coordinated and consistent in its work. Let me highlight what the Norwegian government considers to be four key points. First, the importance of the rule of law. The rule of law at the national and international level is essential for sustainable peace and long-term development. We need effective, accountable and transparent institutions at all levels. SDG 16 underpins our work in this area. Poverty reduction, stability and social cohesion are core principles. The rule of law and the prevention of violent extremism are mutually reinforcing. If we are to succeed in um, preventing violent extremism, we must also highlight the positive effects this will have and the values we stand for. We need to create positive narratives that people can relate to, comprehend and be inspired by. UNDP has a central role in the UN's global development and governance work, which is underpinned by SDG 16. Norway believes that uh, UNDP has a comparative, uh, comparative advantage when it comes to promoting democratic governance and supporting conflict prevention and state building in fragile contexts. Secondly, the interdependence of security and development. Security policy, foreign policy and development policy complement one another. It can be argued that without security there can be no development and without development there can be no security. And I think Somalia's uh, Minister of Finance said it quite well when he told me last time I spoke to him in DC a few weeks ago that Al-Shabaab feeds on unemployment. And I think that underlines that point very well. It is therefore vital that we view development and security as a parts of a whole and that we work simultaneously and across all sectors to prevent violent extremism. However, it is sometimes difficult to strike the right balance between the need for development assistance and the need for security. Security measures can be both a necessity and a precondition for receiving development assistance. But we must also acknowledge that if these measures are not applied in the context of the rule of law, they can also be counterproductive and at worst encourage violent extremism. Now, my third point is that the importance of integrating uh, the gender dimension into a comprehensive, whole-of-society approach. Women and girls must be included in a whole-of-society approach. Women constitute at least half of the population, and in conflict areas, the proportion is even higher. <coughs> Leaving women out is therefore both unwise and unjust. We need everyone to participate in efforts to combat violent extremism and to use the experience and comparative advantage that their gender and age provide. Women and girls are often portrayed as victims, but this is not always the case. Women are often carers, but they may also be perpetrators of violence, and they can be powerful mediators and influential peacemakers. We need to take a multidisciplinary and multi-level approach in order to prevent violent extremism. This bring mis brings me to my fourth and last point, cooperation. We are all affected by the negative impacts of violent extremism and the threats it poses. We believe that the UN development system has an important role to play in the prevention of violent extremism through its work to promote democratic governance, job creation and education. Norway is delighted that the UNDP and the Office of Counterterrorism will be using this occasion to sign an MOU formalizing cooperation on preventing violent extremism and underlining the importance of a whole of UN approach. The UN should work with national, regional and multilateral partners on specific interventions that are tailored to the needs of each country. Engagement with religious leaders is important as is strengthening resilience, not least by focusing on young people and women. The 2030 Agenda, with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals, that the world adopted in 2015, gives us a new approach to development. In order to meet the SDGs, all countries must take ownership of their challenges and use their resources to address them in the best possible way. 
Furthermore, the SDGs imply mutual cooperation and real partnership. We have a shared responsibility to tackle global security challenges, such as violent extremism, and every country has a responsibility to contribute to sustainable development. Let me round off by stressing that Norway is committed to the UN Global Counterterrorism Strategy and the Plan of Action to, pre to Prevent Violent Extremism. The UN Group of Friends of Preventing Violent Extremism, established by Norway and Jordan in 2017, reflects our strong commitment to preventing and addressing the underlying drivers of terrorism and violent extremism. And I would like to thank you all for your support. We continue to push for the increased inclusion of civil society. At the domestic level, Norway's efforts to prevent violent extremism involve the whole government. It is very encouraging to see such broad participation from all over the world at this meeting here today. Policymakers, representatives of civil society, youth representatives, and key experts on preventing violent extremism are all gathered here in this room. This is a treatment, a testament to the level of global engagement to prevent violent extremism in all its forms. You are the experts, and we are here to take advice from you. I wish you a successful and fruitful conference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister Astrup. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll go straight ahead to uh, the administrator of UNDP, Achim Steiner, please. Thank you very much, Leila, Minister Astrup, State Minister Okwed, and my dear colleague, Vladimir. Ladies and gentlemen, it's um, a great pleasure to be with you here in Oslo for this second in a cycle of conferences. And as you know, sometimes in the public domain, conferences are viewed with a degree of skepticism and, and not without reason. But as I was preparing to come to Oslo this time to join you for this, this particular meeting, I was struck by how sometimes conferences are either a product of their time or a catalyst for things to happen that are ripe to happen. And clearly, when uh, the Oslo Center for Governance convened the first conference here in Oslo uh, just over two years ago, we had reached a point where the threat of extremism and the response that countries were searching for in so many different ways, and, and more often than not, seemingly failing at finding the right response, pointed to a need to at least broaden the dialogue in terms of what it is that as nation states, as an international community, as civic societies, we could do about this phenomenon that increasingly has turned, for instance, youth, the thing that we are so proud of as parents that um, we count on as the older generation in terms of the future of our communities, our nations, into almost the enemy of the future. I'm intrigued as I travel across the world today how scared governments are of their own young people. It's a strange time we live in when the relationship between those who lead our communities, our nations, our societies are in fact in a position where the frustrations, the disillusionment, um, the disengagement of the next generation becomes a threat to society. So, in coming together again here in Oslo uh, this May 2018, in this second Oslo conference, we are also, in a sense, taking stock of how far have we gotten from where we were discussing what to do, how to respond in a sense of even basic principles to how we're actually doing with that response as an international community, <clears throat> as the United Nations family, as individual nation states, as leaders in our communities who have taken this challenge of violent extremism on as a central task. The fact that I'm here with Vladimir Voronkov shows already that under our Secretary General Antonio Guterres, there has been a significant step forward taken in terms of the UN counterterrorism strategy, but also the establishment of an office for counterterrorism. The fact that we are both here together, as you just said, Minister Astrup, is also an expression of a very strong signal that we would like to represent jointly here amongst you, but also to the world at large, that preventing violent extremism is much more than just singular answers and responses, depending on which community 
uh, in a government system or indeed in the analytical community you belong to. You would not be here as professionals, as leaders, as um, practitioners if you did not believe that there is a need to broaden the view of how we actually not only frame the strategy for preventing violent extremism, but also how we do it, how we roll it out. And therefore, this conference uh, this year here in Oslo is meant to provide us all with lessons from the front lines. Many of you are here. The state minister from Sudan will speak to some of the experience that we have had, um, both as partners, UNDP and Sudan, but also what Sudan has, as a government, as a nation, taken in terms of steps of re-engaging with young people, of engaging with those who want to drive extremism as a wedge into a society. And there are some fascinating lessons that we have learned together, Minister, so I'm also delighted that we're here. And just to <coughs> also affirm again to Minister Astrup, as you have said, Norway um, is no accidental um, godparent to this particular cycle of conferences. Um, you have been very much part of that voice that has argued from the beginning that in confronting violent extremism, terrorism, the, the threats to the fabric of our societies, we need to work not only in a security and, um, let's say, defense reflex, we must go back to actually asking some fundamental questions of engagement. To my mind, <coughs> the discussion on preventing violent extremism has significantly shifted to where we set out uh, some years ago. <coughs> the initial response of containment, which particularly under pressure of uh, violent attacks of seeing increasing numbers of people being recruited and being, in a sense, taken out of our community and into these movements, has also led to a recognition that containment alone simply will not succeed. We have to begin to talk about the context in which these uh, trends are unfolding. And therefore, very quickly, from a containment strategy, we move towards an engagement strategy. And I think this is a very significant part of explaining what is changing in the way we approach it. We also clearly have come a long way from uh, being focused on the symptoms, whether it is the names that these groups give themselves, the faces that we associate with them, the links that we create to religious faith or ethnic uh, identities that, you know, at the end of the day are simply vehicles that are being used, are being manipulated in order for a certain political view of the world to be propagated. Let us also be clear, we sometimes struggle with the definition of a terrorist. In the United Nations to this day, we cannot exactly agree how to define a terrorist. This may sound odd, and it may sound to the outside world as if it is a preoccupation of those who spend a lot of their time on commas and words and definitions, but the truth is there is many a head of state in our history who began his or her career as a so-called terrorist. And it does beg the question, when does terrorism become a legitimate form of resistance? When does an absolution occur between a battle that is fought and the legitimacy conferred upon a leader of a movement who now happens to be head of state or government? We face some serious issues of contradiction here, at least of trying to reconcile uh, historical realities with contemporary political um, pragmatic realities. In the work that we, particularly in the United Nations Development Program, do, I have been intrigued in the uh, nine, ten months that I'm now uh, in my position in New York to discover within UNDP a very significant portfolio, first of all, of projects and programs that are specifically called Preventing Violent Extremism, PVE projects. And well beyond that, a significant portfolio of activities that we would consider to be integral to the notion that you, Minister, alluded to just now. Very often, the context within which extremism grows is, to some extent, not in a singular sense, but in a very prevalent sense, linked to failures in development. Whether in the integrity and the credibility and the legitimacy of the institutions that represent the nation state. And I'm sure my colleague uh, Vladimir in a moment will speak to that also. Very often it is the desperation of disengagement and frustration that leads people to abandon 
the notion of their nation state or the institutions that represent it because they have not delivered. It is also a phenomenon of marginalization and exclusion, whether on racial grounds, on religious grounds, or simply in terms of the geography of development. How often have development economists conducted development investment reviews in the same way that a company undertakes a cost-benefit analysis? We should not be surprised if the highest rate of return on investment from a capital investment point of view yields a very different perspective on where we invest in our nation than if we look at where are the people who are most left behind, who are excluded, who by definition in the context of the development process of the last 10, 20, 30, 50 years have found themselves on the outside of that society. How often do I encounter leaders today in crisis and fragile nations who express extreme frustration about their inability to reconnect government to their people against the backdrop of a collapsed state or an insecure situation? Whether it is in Iraq or in Somalia, the example that you cited, Minister, time and again we struggle with the instruments that we bring as an international community to the front lines of this so-called battle against extremism and we have to admit we have significant failures in the way that we deploy ourselves, in the way that we utilize significant financial resources of the international community and yet lack sometimes either the ability, the imagination, the license, the authority, the creativity, all of these are part of the problem in going beyond the solutions that we have, in a sense, become used to bringing to this frontline battle. I don't have much time this morning, so I wanted to just briefly sketch out the directional perspective with which I personally, but also we in UNDP, based on our work, and also informed by the first Oslo conference, and hopefully by this conference, intend to move forward. The Memorandum of Understanding that we are signing this morning between the Office of Counterterrorism and the United Nations Development Program is more than just a piece of paper. It marks a new era in the United Nations where a UN counterterrorism strategy meets Agenda 2030 and the SDGs. And to some, this is not always a comfortable narrative. I must say personally, as a development economist who is certainly in terms of his history more on the spectrum of pacifism than active engagement in military or other security agendas, I have to say to you, I feel extremely comfortable with this partnership. Because it is the truth, both in terms of the analytical lessons we have learned, that whatever you try and do in this world, if you believe that you can prevent violent extremism by deploying a military and security response exclusively, you are more likely to fail than to succeed. We have bitter lessons that we have learned in this process. And that development in itself also is no panacea. Sometimes we require a stabilization of an extremely critical and volatile political situation in order to begin to be able to think about development again. We are at the moment on the front lines in Iraq as the United Nations Development Program working with the government of Iraq in implementing a historically unprecedented ambitious program of literally moving into 31 cities when they were liberated from ISIS and beginning literally within 24 hours to reconnect the basics of the infrastructure that would allow people to return. That is one way you try to stabilize lives. We helped to bring 3.7 million people back to the cities, often terrible uh, sites of destruction, but essentially giving people a reason to believe in the future again rather than being stuck in the tented camp for years. This is the beginning of some of the work that we do. But ultimately it is about development. It is about precisely the issues that Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals have put before us as hard but vital lessons of when development succeeds and when it fails. At the end of the day, our promise as the United Nations must be that we stand by countries and nations in trying to bring a more intelligent response than simply stigmatizing those who have captured the agenda by virtue of hijacking religion, ethnic identity, or claiming to be representing a particular generation. Our youth is our greatest hope, not our greatest threat. And in that sense, I also want to say that as the United Nations, it is also important that we speak to the public in a sense that reiterates that we actually live in an age of enlightenment 
and not of crusades and jihads and nationalist extremism. <coughs> that is also the vital role that multilateralism and the United Nations, with its charter and its principles, brings to this vital action and community that is trying to prevent violent extremism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Steiner. Thank you also for ending on that hopeful note, and let's keep it uh, to that as well. Um, next out is USG Veron Group, please. Good morning. <coughs> Thank you, Leila, for introducing me f as a very uh, experienced and uh, practitioner, ex extremely qualified person. I'm still learning. <laughs> Mr. Minister Astrud, thank you very much for your words addressed to my office for your very strong political and financial support. I think that uh, we need to cooperate even better. We have very good cooperation with your team in New York. But because of this very generous contribution, we need to increase the level of our cooperation to spend money in the most important, in, in the most effective and uh, in the most resultative way. And of course, we will do it, this together with uh, my friend Akim, because today we will sign this memorandum of understanding. I think it's a qualitative step forward. We need to increase this internal UN cooperation because this is the only way for future how to make our work effective, how to reach the results which are in uh, line with the expectations of the member states. It should be a new philosophy of action and I think that today's discussion will be also oriented to reach this very result, how to support the United Nations in this common action. I would also like to welcome Her Excellency State Minister of Sudan, Somia Okoyet, and uh, thank her for excellent cooperation between my office and uh, the government of Sudan. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres placed high importance on preventing violent extremism and personally spearheads a common approach on PVE through the high-level PV Action Group. The prevention of violent extremism is one of the top priorities and part of the core mandate of the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism. As the Secretary General highlighted in his major counterterrorism statement in London yet last year, prevention is the first line of defense against violent extremism and terrorism. There are not quick fixes to tackle this complex and multifaceted threat. Addressing violent extremism and terrorism through security measures uh, is essential but rarely sufficient on its own. We need to focus our efforts on coordinations, on, on conditions that are conducive to young men and women being lured by violent extremism and terrorism. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations is stepping up its efforts to prevent violent extremism. More than two-thirds of the initiatives of the United Nations of Office of Counterterrorism, for example, are dedicated to addressing the, conduci the conditions cond conducive to the spread of terrorism. It means that the title of my office is not a very correct one. <laughs> because we are doing this soft power, we are doing this prevention action, we are doing rehabilitation activities, but it's uh, a part of counter-terrorism activities. We are not doing this hard job. These efforts are based on the consensus that the United Nations General Assembly that mandated the United Nations to support requesting member states in this important area. The Secretary General himself has directly instructed the United Nations system to place high, high priority on the prevention of violent extremism 
uh, based on national ownership. It's a sovereign right of a country to request or not uh, to request this assistance. It's a demand-driven process. Because of that, this process is very natural. We have more and more countries asking the office to support them and counter prevention of violent in prevention of violent extremism activities. And this is very important feature of our work because we are kind of enterprise. We have a request, we are trying to build up our capacities in order to address this request. I think this is the most uh, important in our work to react effectively on this request of the member states because it's a dialogue. It's give and take. And I think it's the uh, right philosophy for the current period of time. As a result, a growing number of member states from all the regions of the world are requesting the United Nations to support them through the sharing of good practices and concrete capacity building projects. As for now, 15 United Nations entities are implementing more than 260 PV projects in 84 countries. It's a very significant result. In order to coordinate and make this work more coherent and collaborative, the Secretary General has nominated the Office of Counterterrorism as his Secretariat uh, of the High Level PV Action Group. We also chair a United Nations Interagency PV Working Group to foster information exchange and collaboration. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. As I mentioned before, the United Nations efforts to prevent violent extremism are based on General Assembly resolutions and driven by high demand from governments from around the world. However, due to a differences of opinion among member states on the approach on prevention agenda, this area of work has become one of the key challenges facing member states as they seek to forge a consensus outcome for the sixth review of the global counterterrorist strategy taking place in June in the General Assembly. It's a very important point. You know, we need to have the next consensus resolution on counterterrorist strategy. You know, my feeling is that there is no disagreement about substance of what does it mean, uh, prevention of violent extremism. But the definition is uh, looking suspicious for a group of countries. So I think we need to work together in order to convince this group of countries that it's going on about common efforts, common action, not interference in different countries under this chapeau. And I think it's one of the main prerequisites for the process of a review to be successful finally. So my request is to you to work closely with all the member states who are hesitating to use this formula, who are trying to seek something which is not really in place in this, in this uh, approach. For this reason, I would like to appeal to member states to engage in dialogue and discussion to build the necessary common understanding on this very issue. It's essential that the international community remains united and increases its international cooperation to comprehensively address the threat of violent extremism and terrorism. It's very important to reach a compromise in the first ever counter-terrorism week of the United Nations. It's also a historic event. First time this year we will have a June, the whole week devoted to the discussion on counter-terrorism and prevention of violent extremism issue. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in order to foster a more practical approach to preventing and countering terrorism, the Secretary General is holding a high-level conference of heads of counter-terrorism agencies of member states immediately after the sixth review of the global counter-terrorist strategy. The conference aims to exchange good practices and lessons learned and build a new partnership to increase international counter-terrorism cooperation. One of the four sessions of the conference will focus on strengthening global action to prevent violent extremism including by engaging youth and preventing misuse of new technologies by 
internet by terrorists. It will be a key session bringing together both practitioners and representatives of civil society. In my feeling, the second day of the conference will be the most important one because it will be a direct discussion between practitioners and representatives of uh, civil society. And I think it will create a new climate in this cooperation because still we need to do more in our cooperation with the civil society. We need to draw our uh, experiences from their experience. We need to work closely every day because it's going on about common efforts. It's not uh, only governments who, who are responsible for this very task, but it's the whole society should work against counter-terrorism and uh, terrorist narratives, against uh, attempts to, uh, to, 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 to hire people for different kinds of criminal activities. So civil society has an important role to play in regard to our joint efforts to counter terrorism and prevent violent extremism. We are doing our best to ensure adequate participation of civil society representative from all regions of the world in the conference. I think balanced representation is also very important. We need to have people working as the representatives of civil society from all the globe because we need to have the whole picture of these activities. The conference will uh, thus serve to promote an inclusive approach to preventing violent extremism. As recommended by the Global Counterterrorism Strategy, the Security Council Resolution 1624-2005 against incitement to terrorism and 2178-2014 against foreign terrorist fighters. This session and the session on strengthening the role of and capacity of the United Nations to support member states to implement the United Nations global counter-terrorism strategy will be open to the participation of the civil society organizations. So the whole second day of the conference will be an open exercise, including the final statement of the Secretary General. The Secretary General believes uh, that we need to look at creative and dynamic ways of partnering with youth. We need to support them with more employment opportunities, relevant education and skills development. This is uh, one of the most important ways for the international community to prevent violent extremism. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary General has asked the Office of Counterterrorism to further improve UN coordination and coherence in its prevention of violent extremism and counterterrorism efforts and has signed a new UN system wide global counterterrorism coordination compact with 36 UN entities, Interpol, and the World Customs Organization. You know, my first surprise when I arrived to this new position in New York was that 38 entities are doing counter-terrorism and prevention of violent extremism. This is a unique case for the United Nations. But still, we should do more. And because to do more, we need to work in a more coherent and coordinated manner. And Compact is designed for this very issue. The Global Counterterrorism Coordination Compact provides clear terms of reference for engagement between compact entities and will ultimately enable us to better serve our member states. The compact will help us support the implementation of the United Nations Global Counterterrorism Strategy, involve United Nations country teams in counterterrorism and PVA activities through a country-by-country -country approach. Help share relevant capacity building and coordination and coherence related information with member states, uh, with members of the compact. Develop mutually reinforcing counter-terrorism and PVA capacity building projects and establish a joint resource mobilization and outreach strategy with donors. The last is very important to raise money together and to spend money together and to control how we spend this money because evaluation is not the very strong point 
of our activities, and we need to learn more from the experiences of the member states how to assess our work with different methodologies. And uh, I ask, I request member states to help us in brushing up of these approaches. Based on this compact, a number of UN entities are int intensifying the, their collaboration. For example, over the past month, we have managed to significantly improve our cooperation with United Nations Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorate, or CITED. Thanks to the adoption in December last year of, of the Security Council Resolution 2395, we have also started to build up our capacity in the field using as a basis CITED uh, expertise. It's very important. CITED has all the necessary instruments to evaluate the implementation of different Security Council resolutions. They are providing us with expertise. On the base of this expertise, we are ready to build up our capacities in different countries to support member states and their prevention of violent extremism and counter-terrorism activities. We are also bringing together UN entities through different partnership framework. For example, UN OCT is signing its first, its first memorandum of understanding with UNDP today, and I'm very grateful to Akim for very strong support from the very beginning of this idea to have a memorandum of, of understanding, because it's again a certain logic. We have no field presence, but uh, for our office to understand what's going in real terms in the field is very important, and this is the tool. We could share our expertise together, trying to work in a very coordinated manner in different parts of the world. And I, I am absolutely sure that the signing of this memorandum improve our work significantly. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of the year, we have launched a global UNOCT PV policy program that supports requesting member states and regional organizations in developing their PV policies and national and regional plans based on their request and on national ownership. Through this program, we are combining UNOCT's policy expertise with the sustained presence of UNDP on the ground to utilize synergies and maximize our impact. I want to express my sincere gratitude to the governments of Norway and the Republic of Korea for their generous support and financial contributions to the success of this new program. At the regional level, UNFCT has already supported member states through the League of Arab States, Asian, CARICOM, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, the G5 Sahel Group countries, Southern African states and Central Asian states in developing their regional counterterrorism and prevention of violent extremism plans and strategies. I just visited Central Asian states, Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, and I can tell you that they are eager to have more support and assistance from uh, the United Nations. This is a very fragile region, very close to Afghanistan, with these foreign terrorism fighters uh, which are on their way or inside Afghanistan at this very moment to increase resilience of these countries. It's our common task and I think we should do more. Uh, this is uh, a unique combination of countries which uh, signed and approved a joint plan of action on prevention of violent extremism and terrorism. This is a unique document. Uh, this is the only region which managed to agree on this kind of document. We are all working, for example, with G5 Sahel, but still not uh, reaching this agreement from all the countries. So I think we need to promote more this kind of positive experience to different parts of the world because it's important. It creates a legal framework for counterterrorism and prevention of violent extremism activities. And I think civil society should contribute more to these activities to support the governments, to advise the governments to be more active in this regard. This is a very practical and pragmatic task and we need also to 
have this understanding that this is the right way forward. At the national level, we are su- uh, supporting special representative of the United Nations Secretary General and United Nations country teams with expertise and provide coordinated all of UN support to requesting member states in Tunisia, Jordan, Sudan, Indonesia, Somalia, Mali, and Mauritania. Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to our discussions and the exchange of good practices and lessons learned during uh, this important conference. I believe that events like this will help us to engage on the political, practical dimension of our work and ultimately improve our support to member states in better preventing violent extremism around the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Voronkov, Mr. Voronkov, uh, for the, those uh, insights and remarks. Um, I know that our Minister Astrup uh, unfortunately need to leave at uh, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock sharp. Um, so please join me in excusing him when that moment comes. But before that, uh, let me give the word to the State Minister uh, of Sudan, Soumya Akkad. I'm very pleased that you're here, and I know it was a very last-minute decision to come. So thank you to your to your Prime Minister as well for letting you l- leave your country for a few days and joining us here. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, first, uh, first of all, let me uh, thank His Excellency, the Minister of International Development, uh, Norway, and thanks again for the UNDP administrators and the Gen- uh, Under Secretary General of the Office of the uh, Counter Treaties. Uh, coming back, uh, my talk will be a little bit different from those uh, what is mentioned because uh, what I'm going to give my speech is around the way how we can do it at the national levels. What is uh, what is our experience, uh, and it's not an easy coming from a country that had been described as one of the countries that uh, supporting uh, those issues. Definitely, we as a Sudan uh, peoples and, and, and Sudan government, we, we really highly appreciate all the efforts that uh, uh, done with us from the international uh, community, but specifically what is uh, uh, given to us as a support, uh, support uh, from the UNDB. So uh, definitely this is an, an issue that uh, is affecting everyone all over the globe. And no doubt it's, uh, it's not exceptional uh, for, 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 for us or for uh, any single country to be protected against that. And, uh, and definitely it's also not an issue uh, that is, is just related to, to one single cause or relate to our religious or relate to specific factors. We, we need to work really in deeps and we need to work really on a scientific approach, but uh, uh, bringing back also the context under which we work, the values of the peoples. Those issues are really something that need to be treated well when it comes to those, uh, uh, the issue of the uh, violent, uh, uh, preventing violent extremism. I'm going to show what uh, Sudan uh, do and, and how uh, we can uh, see ourselves. Uh, we are not just uh, what the, the, the globe is describing us like a country that supports the tourism, but we are really playing a role in really combating this issue, in really uh, uh, giving a, a white hand that this issue is also harm us, harm our futures. When it comes to the Sudan and the people who are at high risk is the use and use for us is our future. So it's, it's something that even uh, giving the, the, the risk for the, for the nation. And no doubtful, if you are someone that the people look to you, you are one of those doing this bad issue, and you are in reality not like that. You are even affected by that. It's need from your side to come up with something that 
It's really sure your commitment. You are against this, but you are work in your perspective. You are work under your uh, 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 context, uh, under your value. So for Sudan experience, no doubtfuls, as our geographical location is, is very important for this issue and bringing these combinations between the, West, the West and East Africa, but also bringing these combinations from uh, Africa to uh, Arab states and being a part of the Middle East, uh, which we will see like this issue is an important issue for us. Uh, let us be uh, in the heart of this uh, process. So. Uh, we are start earlier by 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 really uh, establish our commissions for, for for these issues and and we try to do it institutionally and we try to do it differently really engaging all the people talk with all the communities uh, seeing how we're gonna go on that this is our 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 first inspiration issue and we're going to also do it in a, in a scientific way. For that, we seen, we are proud about what, what we do, both uh, government of Sudan and UNDB, in doing this study. And those such type of study to be done in a country like our situation is going from the sensitivity to a real uh, talking about the issue. So bringing back the evidence base uh, regarding the issue of uh, violent extremism is being one of our uh, basic agenda. And we work for a long time. We uh, do a lot of uh, uh, plans, but coming back and realizing that we need really to talk to those people whom uh, had the experience of doing that, those returner back, or those who still had the views, this is a good issue, they're going to do so. And opening the dialogue with them, this is one of the uh, proudness of our experience. And, and after that, it's really show us the difference, the different perspective. Yeah, it is not about security, as he said. Yes, it is an issue that protects security, build peace. But the reason is not just about security. Is there is a lot of angle. The social coherence, the issue of the marginalization, the issue of uh, uh, development, the issue of uh, what youth will do if they are grows in a, a country that, uh, or in a context that they cannot have their future's dream. So they're going to have change in their uh, perspectives. So they're going to navigate to see something. And, and this is something that needs a lot of work collectively from the globe to address those issues. So uh, for us doing this uh, study show us the right way to navigate. But also we are proud of what Sudan do establishing these intellectual dialogue centers. And in these intellectual dialogue centers, the religious leader come and debate those youths. Come and debate those youths around, this is not Islam. This is not the right way to treat your issue. If even you are a victim for whatever marginalizations or you are a victim of whenever you think this is not the right way. So this intellectual dialogue uh, bring a combination between religious leaders, but also academians, psychologists, psychiatrists, all of them are on one table to uh, discuss, to dialogue with those youth uh, 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 who are being, and it's a successful story, returning back uh, a lot of number of our youth, those uh, join uh, 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 the Islam State, or those join Boko Haram, or those join uh, uh, Jihad, or those join Nusra, a lot of them were bringing them back. We didn't send them to the prisons but, we, prisons, but we send them to an area where they can have an, uh, an, a conducive environment, a supportive environment, and start uh, step by step, do the dialogue with them, till uh, a lot of them had been reintegrated to the community. And we've been watching them over the times, and they really integrate. But we face uh, other challenges that when we integrate them back, then the community looks uh, to them in a, in a social stigma way. And this is also need to be needed and need to be treated. 
those for 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 youth whom had uh, the perspective uh, uh, that is uh, around their ideas or but a lot of uh, others are going to this issue regarding social coherence or development angles or they didn't have their opportunities and those are the issues that the globe can come together to avail for, for, for them a little bit more uh, uh, conducive environments that they cannot think about uh, joining these tourist uh, uh, groups. And I like the combination between the development and security because this is the real, what we need right now in doing this detailed analysis and in really addressing the root cause of the, uh, of the issue. And then when we're going to design our, our programs, definitely we need to uh, appreciate the unique status of every different countries. No one can come and, 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 and be more oriented uh, more than me about Sudan. Whenever data you had in your uh, profiles or in your literature, but you are not familiar with the very sensitive issue that the community will respect those issues and will work with you in a collective manner. So this is an issue that need from the UN family, from the Security Council, to realize on the <coughs> ability of the national themselves to lead the process, because leading the process by those are really know how to navigate about the issue is a better, uh, uh, better way to, to think it. So what we do in collaboration with UNDB we start uh, working our national strategy, a Sudan national strategy for preventing and combating the uh, violent extremism. And we start a huge dialogue among the youth, using the youth unions as the mediators, and go and sit with them, dialogue with them, using the women unions, all the affected families. The good news, we not encourage, but motivate those mothers for those youth who be affected by that. It's been a part of our network to work on that. And it is tough when mothers come and describe to people what the harmonies that happen for her child, what harmonies happen for her family, what harmonies happen for her neighborhood. All those issues are very important when it comes to a, a socially connected uh, 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 community like uh, us in, in Africa or in, the, in Arab League uh, uh, countries. So you need to, to really address the difference. And we are proud about what we, we do, the Imam film. I hope some of you had been watched the, the Imam film because we, we also make sure that the awareness, when you do awareness, you need to touch the heart of the peoples. This is what is happening. This is the harmful. And the way that uh, the film is done is, is also been uh, uh, a very uh, proud story because this is a combination of Sudanese youth whom are doing this uh, film. And, and, and it's also about enhancing the industry of the film in Sudan. It's beyond the, the violent extremism, but it's also giving them an inspiration to talk about the issue and to, to do something that valuable for the issue. No doubt, full Sudan is playing a major role in its re region by giving, a, 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 I'm not going to say technical support, I'm, I'm not like this word, but I'm giving hands to our brothers in the Igat country and giving hands to the uh, regional uh, office uh, for the violent extremism in Djibouti and, and share the experience that Sudan is work and definitely it may work in the country like our context and and definitely Imam film had been requested by many countries to share this experience to use this film in uh, in in the issue of raising awareness coming back to our national strategy towards uh, uh, preventing and uh, combating the uh, violent extremism we we are doing a huge consultations and the uh, uh, religious leaders play a role on that 
play a role, play a, a big role on that, but youth themselves, women themselves, and local communities, and it's, it's, it's a, it will be a combination about addressing those sensitive issues, but about uh, yeah, but about treating, but about treating the uh, issue related to the uh, development angle, the issue related to uh, uh, social coherence angle, the issue related to uh, the uh, marginalization and keeping peace and peace building. Uh, those are the issues will be addressed under our uh, our national strategy that will be soon with the collaborations with the UNDB and uh, the Office of uh, uh, the Commissioners of Violent Extremism will be launched in, in coming October and it will be our strategic uh, way forward to work on that. And uh, uh, um, thank you, I will stop uh, here. Thank you for, for, for inviting me to be in here. Thank you for all the support that we have from both sides, you and family, as well as I, I really thank the uh, government and people of Norway for their great support that they give to Sudan. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. State Minister, sorry for having to cut you short. Uh, we are running a bit uh, late on time. Um, now, uh, finally, uh, someone who could not make it here is maybe one of our greatest voices in this work, a representative of the greatest voices. All of you spoke of our youth as our greatest hope, not the greatest threat. Um, all of you eloquently said that. Now, we have a video message from a youth, a UN, DUN special envoy on youth, Jayatma Vikram Nayaka, who could not be here today, but she sent us a, a, a video message. So please. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow young people. My name is Jayatma Vikramanayake and I am the United Nations Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. It is my pleasure to send this video message to this important gathering. I thank UNDP and the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for convening this meeting and organizing a session that is entirely dedicated to the positive role young people play in addressing and preventing violent extremism. Even though it is reported that more young people are joining violent extremist groups than any other age demographic, evidence shows that most of young people neither fall prey to the tactics of terrorists nor are interested in violence. In so many countries and territories, young people's resilience are already transforming communities. There are countless youth movements and organizations out there that contribute to waging peace, fighting injustice and driving social progress and development. Allow me to congratulate UNDP for their excellent research initiative, Frontlines. The findings of this research demonstrate that we should not downplay the role young women and men play as preventers of violent extremism. On the contrary, we should all do better to question our assumptions and identify, promote and scale up youth-led initiatives. I hope that your recommendations will inform more youth-inclusive and effective programming. I'm glad that you will hear about concrete examples of the impressive work done in the field by young peace builders who deserve all our attention, respect and support. As highlighted in the recently released progress study on youth peace and security, investing in young people's agency is probably the best way to move from remedial measures to preventive approaches. Youth is a top priority for the United Nations and I will ensure that your decisions and the evidence that will emerge from them inform our collective efforts aimed at youth development. Thank you. So we've heard from uh, five individuals, UN officials, state ministers, the youth representative. Now in this room, I know there are 
tremendous expertise and testimonies. And there will be ample chance to get into discussions over the next few days. Um, I know that all of this, and I would like to thank the Special State Minister for really bringing us to the ground, for bringing some of the challenges, for bringing to the table some of the challenges that, that many of us are facing and many of you on the ground are facing. Um, we need to end this session now in the interest of time. Um, and what we will do now is there will be a couple of videos uh, shown here. And at the same time, um, in the name of collaboration and cooperation, a memorandum of understanding will be signed uh, in another room. So I ask those who have been invited to the ceremony to, to follow um, the UNDP and, and, uh, and the oh, UN I'm Office of Counterterrorism, um, and the rest of us to stay behind and watch the video. There'll be a break afterwards, and then we'll really get into the nitty-gritty of all of this. Um, thank you for your patience. Thank you for um, keeping those questions to the later sessions. Thank you to all the panelists, and uh, good luck with the next few days. Thank you.